Hi, this is Pat DeSalvo with Save Our Brown, and you're listening to Nothing Shocking Podcast. Enjoy. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil and spun. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unted, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is Pat DeSalvo of Savoy Brown. Uh, promoting the 45th and last album from Savoy Brown, Blues All Around. Yeah, great, fantastic blues album. It was the uh, uh, last uh, songwritings of Kim Simmons. Yeah. And uh, uh, Pat was part of the team that put this last bit of work together. So let's get to that interview. All man. right, good night. Good night. All right, Pat, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unted. Pat, thanks for joining us tonight. How are you doing? Pleasure to meet you. Well, uh, this past February, Savoy Brown released what the band's, is this correct, the 45th studio album, Blues All Around, is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Man, can you give our listeners a little insight on the uh, creative process for this album? Well, it was different than previous recordings. Normally, Kim... All through his career, the whole band would go in, and it would be like a live session. But due to Kim's um, uh, situation with the, with uh, cancer, uh, we actually used demos he had, and we played to the demos. Mm -hmm. So it was a completely different process. And for the last bunch of records, we have been using Ben Elliott, and uh, Kim couldn't travel. So we used a uh, a studio we've been that we did like ten other albums with up in uh, Syracuse Subcat. Mm -hmm. So it was it was uh, the whole thing was r really uh, different in so many aspects. Um, one, you know, we knew Kim was ill, and and uh, it wasn't even just the process. We just knew that Kim was so ill at this point that it was probably our last recording with him, yeah. Eric. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just um, just went in and did the best we could. And we hadn't practiced uh, because we couldn't, <laughs> you know, between COVID happening, we finally went on the road. We did one show and um, outside of Chicago and St. Charles, and we all knew something was up with Kim. He, he just wasn't feeling right. And um, when I came back up uh, to New York, a couple of weeks later, he couldn't even get out of bed. Mm. So it was um, it was really um, it was pretty devastating. I got to be honest with you. And then he got neuropathy, and when you do chemo, that happens. It kills you know it basically kills your body. 
so he could only play certain things and only could do certain, you know, he couldn't function, you know, correctly yeah. like mm. he was in the past. So it was, it was very tough. I got to be honest with you. The first day in the studio, he wasn't even there. He was at the uh, Roswell Cancer Institute. I don't mean to be bo- um, a bummer about this, but, right. you know, let's, let's put it out like it was. And uh, me and Garnett hadn't rehearsed, hadn't done anything. We had uh, 14 tracks we laid down the first day. And the reason we were able to do that is me and Garnett had played prior to Kim, and then we had worked with Kim for about 20 years in the studio and then on the road. So we pretty much knew what he was looking for. So uh, it was, uh, but but it was very somber. You know what I mean? It's like you, 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 you know, we, everybody realizes it probably was our last record. In saying that, after we did the record, Kim kept sending me demos. He sent me demos right to the couple weeks before he had passed. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was really weird. It's the whole thing's just you know, because. Are you are you a musician? Uh, Jeff is. Okay, Jeff. Okay, Jeff. You know how it is when you're with a band. There's that. Um, it's like a family, yeah. dysfunctional family, oh, but it's yeah. like a family. And um, when you develop a relationship, like you got to realize, for years we had traveled all around the world. We've been on four or five different continents together. We've been in Japan. We just been all over the place. And there was this relationship that we had developed. And um, and why we had developed that relationship is because there was a respect among each other. And that's why people go, how come the band lasted so long? That, you know, because Kim has gone through a lot of players. And um, it was really the respect and our work ethic that we, that me and Garnett had, the drummer. And uh, Kim respected that and... Um, it, it just we just grew and we did some we you know anybody that records <laughs> thinks this is the best thing they did that's that's just yeah. the, the way it is yeah you know what i mean True. normally is it no it is it you know come on it's be it's you, know, you gotta be a realist but we really worked very hard to do to put these records out and do the records the way we did and you know I, none of us are Kim was phenomenal, but me and Garnett were just functional players. We're average guys, you know. Um, and but but Kim upped our game, and um, that's why I think the record sounds. I don't know if you're familiar with Witchy Feeling or City yes, Nights. Yeah. Or, yeah, City Nights was a great record. I mean, I listen to that record every once in a while, and I go. This is, you know, believe me, I'm very critical of my playing. I never, I'm that guy that, oh, that sucked. I'm like the Rory Gallagher syndrome, (laughs) where it's like, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, it sucks. No, you play phenomenal tonight. Now, you know, I always think, I always could do better. Right. You know, because, you know, you can't think this is the best you do. It's like, it's crazy, you know. You can always do better. But, um uh, I really feel we did some really good records together. I don't mean to be going all over the place. Now you got to realize I was in a I was in a bar for the last couple hours. So, <laughs> no, you're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. Well, well, can you talk a little bit about that drummer relation, uh, bass player drummer relationship? You got Garnett Grimm. Uh, you know what? Garrett I've worked with. Ton- I got to be honest. I worked with a ton of drummers. I key into the drummer, and. I've always been able to lock in and because I'm not a really good player, I play very functionally and really that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm not Victor Wooten. I'm not Stanley Clark. I'm not Jocko Pistaris. Love all those guys. That's not me. I wish I was sometimes, but it's not. So my, my whole thing is to create a groove and just play for the song. I always listen to the lyrics. You know, when we're ever doing anything, I'll always look at the lyrics of the song. And I try to get a portrait in my head of what someone is doing with the song. I was in a, I was in, um, I'm schooled classically. I went to the Philly Music Academy. I studied at the University of Buffalo and had master classes with Jonas Stark. I did all that stuff. And once again, it, it brought me to a certain place. But I had a teacher, this guy, Bill Harris. And it was in a big band. And he said, okay, he goes, I want you guys to think of a woman. She's walking down the street. And you're you're behind her. And he goes, 
her ass is going this way, it's going that way, it's going this way. He goes, now I want you motherfuckers to play this way. So just think of that girl in your head. I love this guy. He was yeah. a great trombone player. I want you to think about her, and we're playing this song. That's what I want you to do, because we're, we're rehearsing a, um, I forgot what song it was. It, it was a big band song, and it wasn't happening. And he goes, he goes, stop. Here's what I want you. I, I, I want you to image this in your head. And, you know, the band played great after that. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. But, the, but that's what music is about. You right. know what I mean? Music is about, music is like you're telling a story, okay? That's the whole concept of music. You're telling a story. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be functional. It has to communicate that message to somebody. So that's what you got. That's what you, I learned that at a very young. And I, I started playing in bars when I was like 15 too, which was kind of weird. My parents were really into it. They thought it was a great thing, but I was, you know, I was in bars and I would, um, in the, then a couple of days a week, I would unload trucks at a, at a supermarket. And then I, I eventually make it to school. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, yeah. Sometimes I think about what I did. And I go like, "Where the hell? What the hell was I doing?" You know. <laughs> but uh, that's just me. That's just the way I am. But but when you're doing music, you're trying to communicate something to somebody. You're not trying to impress anybody by playing a lot of notes. You know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to tell a story, and the story is the melody, and it's the lyrics. Everything else is you know, icing around the cake mm. because a, a great song, someone should be able to just sing it to you. You know what I mean? Or just grab a guitar, piano and play it. And it, it should have some resonance within you. Like, Oh yeah, I can relate to that. Or you just took me someplace, you know? And that's what music is supposed to do. That's, that's, that's the way I think about it anyway. Yeah, well said. Um, thank you. Know, you. You had a, uh spoke on uh, Kim's demo parts of Blues All Around. Were, were all the demo parts, were they completed for you guys to actually put the finishing touches on this album for you guys to play around? Or did no, you guys kind of... I got to be honest with you, no. Um, they, were, they were demos. And um, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And I just sat yeah. and I listened to them. And I called Garnett a few times. And Garnett was a little stressed about it. He goes, geez, we haven't done this this way. We haven't played together. He goes, we're just going to go in. It was a natural thing. And this is the great thing about music when you play together. It's like a football team. You know, you get these football teams, and one or two years, they're, they're working it all out. You know what I mean? Then all of a sudden, their third or fourth year, they start coming on really strong, mm. like the Buffalo Bills did. But then they felt – then they – I don't know what that will happen to them after that. But, you know, it's like it's like a team. And all of a sudden you start playing like a team. And you start evolving. And you sort of like can anticipate what the other guy is going to do. And that's what that's what happened with this record. Because we didn't rehearse. And me and Garnett, and this is, I'm not bragging or anything right now. Because this is just what happened. And not to say it's great. Other musicians might look at it and go like, nah, it's not really that good. But the thing is, we laid 14 tracks down in six hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But we've always done that. Anytime we went into the studio, it was a, for me and Garnett. Now, you got to realize, me, Garnett, and Kim, when we played, we practiced a real lot. We go in the studio almost ev all the time. We had, the, we had all the basic tracks, the guitar, bass, and drums done within a day, all the time. All the records I did with Kim... And I've done like 16 recordings with them. Yeah. Mm. Granted, some of them were live and some of them were DVDs, but no live DVDs. But it's like whenever we did anything, it was just it, it, it was a natural thing. There was a, it, it grew, though. It took some time, but it grew. It was just naturally. And it's like it's, it's like the Beatles. Think about the Beatles or think about Hendrix. The first couple of records he did or Cream. I mean, you, you can't. You know, you can't manufacture that, you know. Um, it's just something that naturally happens, and it's wonderful when it does. Are you guys familiar with Yormar Kokonau? I am not, uh, no. From, from Hot Tuna, Jefferson Airplane? Yes. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I completely butchered his name, I think, just right now. So we played his place one time, and uh, he's got this place called the First Pe Fur, Fur Peace Ranch. It's in uh, somewhere in Ohio. 
and it's like got a restaurant and it's got a museum and it's got a real nice theater and a studio and it's got these cottages and they do guitar clinics there. So we played there and and this was this guy in the audience, he was just at sound check and sound check is normally closed for us, we don't want anybody in. So there's this guy there and then he comes up to me and he goes, Can I talk to you? And I go, Yeah. And he goes, I'm Norma. And I go, Oh, and nice to meet you. And he goes, this is like something he goes, you know, cause he's been around forever. He goes, you guys got a magic happening. And when someone like this comes up to you and says, this, this is him. He has, he has no dog in the fight. He mm-hmm. could just go there and leave. But he said, you got this magic happening. I'm paraphrasing now. I can't remember exactly what he said. And he goes, you guys are just, this is just like great. This is just amazing. Then he went, then he goes, can I play with you guys tonight? I said, well, of course, <laughs> first at your venue. <laughs> <laughs> and second, you're you know you're you. So he did. He sat in with us, and he had a ball, and we did too. And it was like, but what he, what I'm getting at right now is, it's you don't have to be a phenomenal player. You know what I mean? You don't have to be like L. D. Mule or Pacaduluk or John McLaughlin or any of those guys. But you just gotta work together as a group, and you can create such great music. Did you ever hear the Dawes? Are you familiar with them? I am not. Or no. my morning jacket. They're they're these up-and-coming bands they just play together and they make this wonderful music it's just it's just great stuff and it's very organic you know mm-hmm. like in the 60s and the 70s those guys weren't thinking about anything like any band thinks about today where they're marketing they're doing this and that they just wanted to play right and right. and you know what i mean and i think that's lost on a lot of people where they're thinking like well my demographic says i should probably do this and she'll look like <laughs> these guys just went out put music together and just like a music of the time you know what i mean and they would write these songs about what was going on and it was just you know it's just incredible because you think about it all that music from the 60s and 70s they're still playing it now we're in you know 2023 and it still holds up its value you know where uh maybe not the production quality but what the songs are saying and the way they're playing, it's just, you know, I don't know. I used, it, it, it was a wonderful time. I wish I was really there for the whole thing, you know, where I was like, could have been really, really a part of it. But I'm only 68. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeff, you got the next one? Well, I mean, prior to COVID, how many shows were you guys doing uh, in a year? Oh, quite. We do, we, well, actually, I believe it or not, me and Garnett both have full-time jobs. I do IT work. Okay. And I worked sometimes 50 hours a week doing my, my gig. But we would go on the road. We did 60 or 70 shows, which doesn't doesn't sound a, light, sound a lot, but there's travel days yeah. yep. and there's days off. So it was quite a bit of time we were on the road. Uh, we went to Europe one time for like a little over a month, and we did like, I think, 10 countries, 28 or 29 shows. Mm. And I got, I got a great story, and I've told this a few times. So we're playing, and Kim is going, I love German food. I love German beer, even though we didn't drink. German women are beautiful. He's going on and on, and I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? I, 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 I go behind him. I go, we're in Belgium. We're not, you're not even in the wrong city. You're in the wrong country right now, you know? And he just jumped into the, the next song we were going to do. I thought that was funny. <laughs> you know, because he's like, he's talking to these people. They're like, what is he saying? What's, about, what's he talking about Germany for, you know? But um, we, did quite, we did quite a few shows. We could have done more, but we, our, our um, business model, I hate to say that, but our business model was to do get a good couple anchor dates, do a couple shows around it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. We didn't want, we didn't want, cause here's what happens with a lot of bands. And it's, it's sad. This is just the way it is. They do this for a living, right? Yep. So you got to work as much as you can because mm-hmm. you got to make money. But because me and Garnett had jobs, we could like cherry pick the job, the, the gigs we wanted to do. Kim could do that and go, okay, I don't have to be on the road all the time. Because you go on the road, and, you know, after a while, no matter what anybody says, it becomes a job. And you're playing a place, and maybe there's not a good crowd, or maybe the band isn't on because it's really tired because it's like it's the 12th show they did in a row. And what really we wanted to do, for, and this is really for the fans, too, because, you know, without them, what the hell are we doing? You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. you're, you're, 
you know, you, there's no reason to be doing this. You know, you might as well play in a garage, or you are going to be playing in a garage. So when you do a show, you want to do the best show you can. These people have taken time out of their schedule to drive to come see you and pay X amount of money to come in the door. And you got to really do a good show for these people. And not only that, what I always say, you got to give them a memory. So when they leave the show and as the week goes on and maybe their week isn't going good, they can think, you know what? I had a great time a couple nights ago. I was with my friends. I saw this band. It brought me back to my, you know, because the band's been around so long. It brought me back to when I was a younger person. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that's what really what is all this about that we're doing? You know, what, what is it we're doing? You know, it's like we're trying to create a memory and we're trying to say something to people. That's all we're doing. You know, we're making noise. Um, Like many different heritage acts, such as Savoy Brown, um, will the band or I, I don't know how to say it without, you know, without Kim being in the band, but yeah. um, will the band, no. I guess the, the question is, will there be a box set or, or you know, or of a, a Chronicles or of some sort of the well, band? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, no, that, um, yeah, I think there is a couple box, there is a box set out. I thought you were going to say, is the band going to continue? Cause I can't no, see it continue. No, 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 no. Yeah. Cause, but see, people keep asking me and I go like, really? That, they'd be like, um, some band going out without Eric Clapton there and going like, hi, we're Eric Clapton. <laughs> oh no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're just a bunch of guys trying to make some money right now. You know, be honest, you know? So I, I personally would like to see a good compilation of the last 20 years, but that's up to Debbie, Kim's wife, mm-hmm. uh, how she wants to represent Kim's history. You know, that's his wife. And, and she really owns the band name and all that. Not me and Garnett. We were just, you know, we were, we're, we're like an afterthought really. Um, all the guys that were in the band years ago, like Roger Earl and Dave Peverett and and uh, Dave Walker, you know, that that's all gone, you know. Mm-hmm. Actually, the first band he had, two of the guys overdosed. Oh. Yep. Their record didn't even come out in the States, too. They were, I mean, there was a lot of, pro- you got to think what they were doing. This is the yeah. 60s, and they're experimenting yeah. with drugs. They're doing stuff. And once again, a band, they're so dysfunctional. Half the musicians I know, you know, they can't feed themselves, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, he was going through this whole thing, trying to keep this band together for all these years. And it's like, you know, working with musicians, it isn't working like with some office people. It's you're working with musicians and they're, they're like strippers. They're fucking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know as a kid, you know, you get, you fantasize about, about bands and that, how, how glamorous it is. And then you, years later you read their memoir and they're, they're all piled in the van and they're, you know, sleeping yeah. in their t-shirts and you know <laughs> cuddled together to yeah. stay warm. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. Believe me, I, I've, done, I've done all that. And uh, but and also I've done a lot of crap gigs where I would do that Holiday Inn circuit back in the day and play six nights a week, stay at a Holiday Inn, they feed you. And it was like, you know, it was like it wasn't work at all. It was like, but it was a lot of fun, you yeah. know. But, yeah, it's like when you're coming up through the ranks, it's it's, you know, it's 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 tough. It really is tough. You really got to love this to, to, to do it. And continue with it, you know. And there's um, there's so many great musicians out there, great bands that just never get their due, and it's it's kind of sad, really. You know, Absolutely. it's uh, but, you know, who's got the best publicists and marketing people, and they get the money put. That, those are the guys who wind up, you know, on top. And but you still got to have songs, you know. You still got to have a what I would consider a product that people want to buy into, you know. But there's so many bands that never, they just don't, it just doesn't happen. It's, it is sad. Yeah. And you, you feel, I feel bad for guys. I know guys that I know back home and, and they're in their forties and fifties at that point, they're still trying to get a record deal or something. It's just like, it's not going to happen. It's like, you know, I gave up at like 32. I decided, okay, I got to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to start eating, you know, and I don't want to eat peanut butter and jelly and macaroni and cheese out of a box, you know. Mm. It'd be nice to have a car that didn't break down every, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a, I'm living with five guys, you know. It's like, <laughs> you know, after a while it gets to be okay. Well, you, you know. <laughs> as you look at the uh, body of work of Savoy Brown, 
during your period, your time period with the band. Um, do you have a, a favorite Savoy Brown album? And do you have another one that maybe is not the best interpretation of the band during your time? During my time, yeah, yeah. I um, City Nights. I think that's a it's a gr- I really like that record. There's so many great songs, and what makes a great song to me is a great story. You know what I mean? Something mm-hmm. I can I can think about and go like, that, I understand that, or that that moves me to do something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that that record really was good. And then Ain't Done Yet was there was another great record. Yeah. Freaking COVID yeah. hit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there's really some great. I don't know if you guys have listened. I don't know where you're at with all this, but there were some great songs on that. I mean, just just great stories. Devil's Highway is like I just love that song. And um, yeah, those, both those albums. Witchy Feeling was a really good album. Um, but those other two were just, I just thought they were just, I just, I always felt bad that they didn't get promoted. Um, things just didn't happen, you know? And that's just, and then again, there's so much music out there. So, so yeah. where do you guys get your, when you guys want to listen to music, where do you guys go to find new music? I'm well, curious. Well, only because I'm forced to. <laughs> I'm forced to go to iTunes um, right. because I got an iPhone. But, I mean, I, I for years I was the guy that, you know, went to the record shop every Friday. I'd go to Best Buy every Friday and just, really? walk, ar- just walk around the shelves and look for something that caught my eye. <laughs> and you, really? can't, you can't do that anymore. No. And you know the only thing is? I hate fucking CDs because – a fucking record you would pick it up you know what i mean yeah there'd be this great artwork you could actually read the liner notes you know and it was just like it was it was a very tangible thing to have and then you know of course they they put the cd out because it was supposed to be better and i think the sound quality sucks on them but that's a whole nother thing and i got a great <laughs> another story i gotta tell you so voodoo moon came out and it came out on vinyl and uh, and the company I was working for, um, uh, the owners were be- were very good friends of mine, huge fans of Savoy Brown, and actually we took him to a SU football game one time. But the thing is, I gave him a record, and his son was there, and his son looked at me and his dad, and he goes, "Why is why is Pat giving you a calendar?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was like. <laughs> You know, how does he know? He's never yeah. seen a record before, you know? But the thing is, vinyl, I just love vinyl. Yeah, you had to pick it up and put it around on the other side, but it was just something about holding that record in your hand, yep. looking at the artwork, reading the liner notes. It was just something that was it became part of you. A CD became so trite-like to me, you know what I mean? It was like... I can't read the liner notes and the artwork I can't really look at. And it's a piece of plastic in my hand and it's so tiny, you know, now you got streaming, which completely devaluates music to me. Yeah. You know, sound wise, you know about the compression thing where mm-hmm. the, the way they do it, you only hear half of what you're going to really supposed to hear. Personally, I'm deaf, so <laughs> I'm glad to hear what I hear, but it's just like the quality's just gone. And it's just like, and, and it's not even there. It's not even your hands. You know what I mean? Well, it's I, just so easy to. Oh no! And it's so easy just to listen to it for a few seconds, skip to the next track, or, or listen to yeah, something exactly. else. Exactly. You wouldn't do that with a record. You put the needle down. And you listen to. How old are you guys? I'm curious. Fifties. Uh, f- early fifties. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So you understand then? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, records were just like it was great to have a record. You know, it was great to have. It was a possession, actually. You know, I don't know how many girls and guys argued about who's going to get what record. I, that that <laughs> story's cropped, crept, crept up a few times. Yeah. I bought that. No, it's mine. You know. Well, I'm going to tell you I'm, how how I discover music now, and it's not necessarily discovering new bands, but so okay. for for instance, I will. I do this a lot with the podcast when I'm doing my research for for artists, but. Um, so, for instance, if I go in, I, I'll go into Google and I'll say bands similar to Savoy Brown, and it'll, okay. take, it'll take me to Last FM. And this is a, a it's a, it's a, I, I don't even, it's a website that's going to give you uh, x amount of hundreds of bands that are similar to Savoy yeah. Brown. And it starts with number what's, one. What's it, called, what's it called again? Uh, I believe it's called Last FM. Le- okay. Yeah. So you just if you just type into Google, you'll say. 
uh, bands similar to Savoy Brown or whatever band you want to type. And it's, that's the first thing that's going to pop up. And it's going to give you right. the bands that are the closest to Savoy Brown. And then as you go to the next page, next page, it kind of gets a little bit dumbed down a little bit. But I find that to be the best way to find old stuff and make it new again. Because, like, hey, I didn't even realize this, was, this band was an actual thing. No, then yeah. I discover them. And so it's like right. it's my way of making something um, something old new again, if it, if, it, if that makes sense. No, that no, complete, complete. Because you know why? Because radio stations had a very narrow radio play that they would put out. Right. Mm-hmm. There's so much stuff out there, and they just would play. You know, I, I got a lot of friends who are DJs, and they would tell me basically there's like 500, 600 songs that are played in America. Yeah. And it's the same friggin' songs. But there's so much others. And they don't go very deep with a. With, even Pandora, when you listen to that, um, like I'll put that on, they, they'll sort of play the same tracks. They don't go very deep, though. Right. What you got to do is not like the songs. Because <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll put some other stuff up. But that, that was the problem with radio. Radio would say, you know, it's a business. We got to market this. Let's play the hits. What are the kids digging? You know, and it's like, you know, that type of thing. Some guy with a tie on and a yellow and black check suit, you know, saying, we got to we got to play what the kids want to hear. And there was so much great music that didn't get played. Like Elvis Costello. I mean, they banned him eventually, you know, but I mean, there was all these bands, Ian Ian Dury and the Blockheads. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There was all the Are you guys familiar with the band Masters of Reality. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Chris is my cousin, Ooh, and oh, Timmy really? Harrington, yeah, and Timmy, Timmy Harrington played in a lounge band together for years on and off. Oh, we went cool. to high school together, and Googe is a friend of mine, and unfortunately, Vinny, me and Vinny, the drummer, were great friends. He's He, he wound up just a bad story. It's sad. But yeah, those guys are all buddies of mine. Grew up with those guys. Not many, not many people realize that Ginger Baker was in that band for a short time either. Yes, he yeah. was. He did, he did a record. My cousin, how long my cousin did that? Actually, we were in the airport one time, and Chris was there, and um, he comes over to me, and goes, "Hey, what's going on?" I go, "What are you doing here?" He goes, uh, "He goes, I gotta go see the ants. They're all dying." <laughs> and I went, I went, I go, uh, "Kim, this is my cousin Chris, and he's in the Masters of Reality." And Kim sort of knew about the band. And I go, and he played with Ginger Baker, and then Kim, like, you know, his eyes lit up a little bit. Oh, really? You know? And um, so they, they had a good discussion, and and that, that was kind of interesting. And Chris, Craig, Chris has done a lot of good stuff. He's produced yes. a lot of cool the Stone Age. He's done a lot of good. He was in that Food Fighters documentary on HBO. Yes. Uh, yeah, he did. He's, uh, and, and Timmy, Timmy, Timmy actually worked for the company, the IT company I worked at. And, um, you know, Timmy's brilliant. He's too smart, though, and he got a couple other record deals after that, and it's just sad because the guy is just, he's so talented. I mean, he's just, he's such a talent. He's always been a talented guy. He's a great artist, still recording and doing things, too. Oh, fantastic. Jeff, you got the next question? But he doesn't. He doesn't get it out, though. He doesn't get his material out. Oh. Go ahead. What's the next question? Oh, yeah. I was just going to ask you about your base. Uh, do you have uh, a large base collection, or do you have a one trusty one that you that you love, or how does it work for you? I got, like, 16 bases, and I've been using uh, – I became friends with Dean Zielinski, and he sent me a couple bases. Um, and I've been using them on my last bunch of records, but – I like all my basses. I, there's, I play upright bass too. I play acoustic bass, you know, because yeah. I went, I studied like at the Philly Music Academy with uh, Neil Courtney. He was the second chair bass player in the Philadelphia Orchestra, and um, I love playing upright. And I played upright on two of Kim's acoustic records, and I play upright on a couple of our um, our uh, Savoy Brown records, but. Um, Really, it's not, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not the instrument, you know, it's like, it's a, not, you know, they say it's not the carpenter, it's the, uh, it's not the tool, it's the carpenter. Yeah. It, I really feel that said, I really, when we're on the road, believe it or not, we'll go, to, we'll fly out somewhere, right guys? Yeah. And they'll just have whatever, you know, we'll, I'll ask for a certain amp, but they'll just have an amp there, you know what I mean? Same with Kim. 
and we used whatever amp they give us, and we usually brought one guitar. Kim, I talked him into play. We we started doing an acoustic set with Savoy Brown, which was kind of cool. And I would bring ele- my electric upright out, and Kim would have an acoustic guitar, and then just his other guitar. But it really isn't the instrument. It's really the it's the touch and the feel that you you yourself that comes out of you. You know yeah, what I mean? Oh, but yeah. but I got a G and L. I got a, I got a sixty four Fender Jazz. I got a bunch of P basses. I got I got a fifty five Dan Electro I got from Joe Bonamasso's dad. I got a ton of stuff. But you know, it doesn't matter. It, it's it's really. I know these some of these guys it really does matter to get these five thousand dollar basses, but it really you know it's really the 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 guy playing the instrument. Um, I got a guy I played with Joe Beard, and he had a and um, he's an, this um, old blues guy, and he could get any. I went to India with him, right? And one night they'd have a PD, they have a Marshall, they had amps I never saw before. He got a same tone every night. And he had this great tone. Kim was the same way. You could give Kim any amp, any guitar, and, you know, within a sound check, he would have that sounding like him. And uh, that, that's an amazing thing to be able to do. Yeah. You know, because some, some guys got to have a ton of pedals. I, I get it. You know, that's cool. That You want to get different tones and stuff. But for a long time, Kim didn't use any pedals at all. And people would be... You know, guitar players would be at the end of the show. Where's his pedal board? And how do you get those sounds? I go, <laughs> it's all coming out of him. Yeah. You know, it's kind of him. And he knows how to get the sound out of the amplifier. And another thing that he always thought was funny, that he thought personally was not funny, but kind of interesting was, everybody wants all these vintage amps. He goes, they don't understand. Those vintage amps, those were the new amps, and that's why we were using them. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because they weren't vintage to us. That was what was there, and that's what you would use, you know. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting how I know a lot of guys that they'll use these old Fenders or Dan Electro amps, and especially the fucking harmonica players. Those guys, oh my god, it's the harmonica, you know. They got all this stuff happening. It's like, come on, you know. They got their bullet mic. They got their other mic. They got a special mic. <laughs> You know, they're using a super twin, but they got a Dan Electro, and it's like, I'm going like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, it's it's a harmonica. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's kind of it's kind of funny. Harmonica players are going to hate me now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Yeah, well, we have one last question for you, and then we'll leave you alone sure. for the evening. Thanks for your time. No, no, no. I, I, I'm having a good time talking to you guys, actually. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. First, thank you for even wanting me to do this. I oh, got to be honest yeah. with you. It's been an honor. So, um, I asked well, this question. Fine. I asked this question to all of our guests. Um, the mystery of rock and roll. It, it's kind of lost itself with the dawning of the internet and social media and what have you. Um, for yes. you, the the artist and the, the fan. What do you prefer? Do you l- prefer this new age of accessibility? Because if we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be doing this with you now. Or do you miss the mystique of rock and roll? I would rather have the mystique. I, I, you, and here's why: when you're in your bed, you're a young kid, and you got the transistor radio on, and you're listening to "Can't He" on, on the road again. Are you familiar with that song? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you're a young kid, and you're listening to that song, and you're listening to those guys say those lyrics. What would you not want to do? What, why would you not want to become a musician and go on the road when you're 12 and 13 years old? And listening to, like, the box tops, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, just listening to that music, and you're young, and you don't – there's a mystique. It becomes your – your vision of that song, not what other people are thinking. You know, you know I mean, it's too cluttered now. Yeah. There's too much opinion out there, and half the opinion I think sucks. You know, that's 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 my opinion. <laughs> but half the opinion, I really don't care. I that's why Neil Young up. I really respected Neil Young when he wouldn't do videos because he goes, it takes away from my song. I, I shouldn't have to visualize this. The the person that's listening to that song, let them have their own opinion of what the song means. It's very you know? true. It's very like, true. Yeah, it's like 
why am I force feeding this or putting this in their head? You know, it's it doesn't it doesn't make sense. You don't want to do that. You you want you want someone to visualize it and take what they hear of that song and take that to their heart. Yeah. I think I, I I mean that's what once again I go back to the storytelling. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you're telling a story. And somebody's going to look at a story one way, and somebody's going to look at it another way. And that's the beauty of art and music to me. Well said. You know? Very well said. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, we're out of our allotted time for the evening. Is there anything that we didn't cover tonight that you would like to plug or promote? Nah, nah. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, to help, to help uh, Debbie, um, go to SavoyBrown.com. Kim's got artwork. Mm-hmm. And you can you can buy the CDs and T-shirts and all the other stuff that you you know that you really don't need but you want to get, mm-hmm. um, for, you know at the at the website and that would help Debbie out right now. The, Debbie's Kim's wife. Okay. Yeah, we'll share that. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. And uh, and that's it. And it's just like you know I I really uh, I'm glad people like you are on the internet and doing this and I appreciate it. It's a double-edged sword. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You want this, but you don't want it. But I really, like, once again, it, it's really, you know, it's really weird. Um, I would listen to these songs, you know, I had my transistor radio on, my mom would come in every once in a while, turn the radio off, you know, and it was like, you know, it's like, you know, the Amboy Dukes would be on or the Strawberry Alarm Clock. You know the story about them? I do the guitar know. player, yeah, straw, the guitar player and the Strawberry Alarm Clock Wanted up playing with Leonard Skinnerd. Who was that? I can't think of his name right now, but he wound up in Leonard Skinnerd. I believe it was Ed King. It's like, cool. it, yeah, it was so weird. I was reading this article, and he wound up leaving because the Leonard Skinner guys were kind of crazy, but he was in the band for a short time. It's like Captain Beefheart was produced by the guy from the Carpenters. You know, there's these weird things. I'm, I'm, I'm a big Frank Zappa fan, too. I don't know if you guys like Zappa, but mm-hmm. yeah. I've always loved Zappa. I mean, he's like, you know, the guy was a friggin' genius. Way, way ahead of his, still not understood, you know. Mm. But um, music just, music really, uh, when I was young, really took me up places. I really needed it. I got to be honest with you. I went to a really shitty junior high school and high school. It was really bad. And music was always my way to get a, get away from everything. It really helped me out a lot. My life could have went many different ways. Um, so this is how things are going to work out. We're about two to three weeks behind on our episodes. But Jeff, yeah. you're the editing wizard. Should get everything polished up for you, and we'll get it to your PR person, and I can send it to you as well. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. But my pleasure, too. Have a good night, guys. You, too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Be good. Be safe. Bye. Everybody grinds the stone and makes their own mistakes.